having to get dressed and show up somewhere. This is a great way to use technology to help education, and that's what we're talking about today, education, specifically special education and uh, even more specifically the evaluation process. So what you have to go through if you're not currently receiving special education to get those services. Again, my name is Joseph Montgomery. I am an attorney that specializes in special education law and pretty much anything that happens in schools. That's me. There's a little bit about me while I talk. And I've been doing this for a number of years now and throughout Pennsylvania and New Jersey. And I understand that this technology allows people from maybe across the country to be present. So I don't know where everybody is from. But the good news about special education law is that it's federally controlled. So while the issues vary slightly from state to state, generally things are pretty consistent throughout the entire country because the blanket law that controls everybody is federal. Uh, with me today, I also, my mom is actually here. We work together. Her name's Dr. Mary Montgomery, and she is, she has been involved in special education for over 40 years. Uh, she's currently the director of the school district, their uh, special education program, the director of pupil services, and in New Jersey. So she has a lot of insight into what goes on inside the schools. So while I'm more or less suing the schools trying to get the services, she has the insight into what the schools are responsible to do to try to create uh, lawsuit-proof IEPs and also make sure that what they do um, is consistent with the federal and the state laws. So she'll speak a little bit today, hopefully. We'll get her to talk a little. So here we go, the evaluation process, like I said, it's controlled by the federal law. And the federal law that controls is IDEA. And that's the Individual with Disabilities Education Act. It's actually currently called the IDEIA because there was an improvement on it in 2004. So the law as it stands, uh, we're at 2014 now, it's relatively new. So it's about you know, 10 years old. So there's there's a number of cases, but there's not all that many. You consider, you know, things like criminal law and contract law that have been around 100, if not more, years. Um, this is a relatively new area of law, and if you've been around special education for uh, any number of years, you may know that not too long ago, maybe just back in the 70s or so, there, there really wasn't any special education services, and kids with medical needs and other needs that should have been educated in schools were required to stay home and there was no laws ensuring that they would get an education. But uh, things, are, things are looking good, and as time goes by, they're looking even better. So um, as far as it goes right now, though, it's the IDEA from 2004 that controls. And through the IDEA, all eligible students, and that's 3 to 21, are entitled to a free and appropriate public education. And that's the key word, FAPE, right? That's the acronym you'll hear a lot in special education law, FAPE. And that is what FAPE stands for. And if you're denied FAPE, that is when you may be entitled to different compensations from the school district. And I'll get into some of those compensations later, but their responsibility is FAPE. Let's see what's the best way to get to the next slide here. Okay, just click it. Um, the evaluation process. So Special education, and I like to talk about the actual definition of the word special education because there's a few words in there that stand out, and here we go. The term special education means specially designed instruction at no cost to parents to meet the unique needs of a child with a disability. So with this, I want to point out the word unique, right, because uh, when, when laws are being designed and written, there's not often extra words added in for no reason. It's not like a, a piece of fiction where you want to make the sentence more flowery. Uh, every word has a purpose and every word creates a legal obligation. So this word unique means that no two children are the same. And how that's been interpreted in courts is to mean that although something may have never been done before, that's not a defense. So you can't say that um, you know in all the cases this particular thing has never been done before for a child. Well, the law takes into account that every child is unique. So um, while there are still limits in theory as to what can be done, 
there's no set rule that, okay, well, you know, this has never been done before, so we can't do it now. That's absolutely not a defense that a school can use. So that's why I like to point out the actual legal definition of the word special education. Also, it's important to note under A here, instruction conducted in the classroom, in the home, in hospitals, institutions, and other settings. So it's not limited to the classroom. If a child has medical needs that uh, has them in their home or in hospitals, then the school is still responsible for providing an education in those settings. Um, in addition to the home and hospitals, it's also been found to include institutional settings such as juvenile um, detention type settings or prisons. Now before we get into special education as a service in schools and before schools should uh, consider special education as an option, the first thing you want to do is see what we can do in the general education setting, right? So there's something called a, the LRE, LRE, and that stands for the least restrictive environment. And the least restrictive environment, you know, generally, because every child has a different LRE because it's, it's what's the least restrictive environment for that child, not for all children. And generally, the least restrictive environment is the general education classroom. So it's what we can do to keep this child in the general education classroom with typically developing peers before we see, okay, well, let's bring them into a different classroom, the special education classroom. Um, so some things that you can do in the general education classroom would be one-to-one -one aids. And actually, I'll let uh, you cut in right now. What other things in the school setting, what have you seen be done in, this, in the general ed classroom um, to help kids stay in there instead of moving them right to special ed? The first thing that's important that Joe had indicated is that um, special education is not the first stop. So if you're told by a school uh, your child is having disciplinary issues and we're going to have to change schools or we're going to have to refer for special education, you're going to want to ask them, what did you do a functional behavioral assessment? Did you make um, a behavior plan up for my child? Like, What have you done to exhaust everything possible? So that um, perhaps your child just needs some extended time in the classroom, perhaps they need um, some, you know, when, when you give a child a test, you're going to perhaps not have you 20 of the same problems, you're only going to have a few. This is when your child is easily distracted or can't cope with having a test with so many different problems in front of them, then you have to address them before you say that your child needs special ed. Special education, you're going to have supports and services that are not available within the general education classroom. So that if your child needs their whole curriculum modified, well then obviously you do have to realize that there are some issues and that you want to get your child evaluated at that time. But again, there has to be pre-referral system and that's in the law as well. So you always want to say, what are you going to do for my child before you make that jump into special ed? Okay, good. And here we go. So. Um, the IDEA requires school officials to work with parents to develop IEPs for all children in need of special education. So I, I put this here because it's really about working together. And um, like it, it was just stated, uh, when the district, they won't say, you know, all of a sudden here we're just going to go right to special ed. The parents should be involved and say, okay, well, here's where I think my child's doing well. Here's where I think my child needs help. And you work together with the school district. And I always promote working together. I don't think it's ever the right thing to do to just automatically jump and, and hire a lawyer. I think before you get a lawyer involved, you should make sure that you exhausted your relationship with the district and have thoroughly tried to work together and see if you can come to resolutions um, together. Now, before IDEA, so this is a, a big protection for the parents. That they're, it's the, the phrase is a meaningful, meaningful participant. Before IDEA, districts could make decisions uh, without the parents' input. So, you know, some districts still today may try to be like, oh, you know, here's what's happening, that you can't do anything about it, and that you may feel like you're being pushed around. Well, they can't do that today. Maybe that's um, a power that's sort of just lingering, and they, they feel that although maybe in the past they could have just made decisions without parents' input and kind of told the parent the way it is, it's not the way it is right now. So um, there's something called a NOREP in, in Pennsylvania, Notice of Recommended Educational Placement. And whenever placements change, the parent has to sign off and agree on that NOREP. And uh, there's also a box on that NOREP to sign that says, I don't agree and I request due process. And that's where if 
you really do not see eye to eye, then there's the due process hearing procedures that you can go through where a, un, uh, a neutral hearing officer, um, in Pennsylvania there's six or so hearing officers, and um, these people are experts in special education and they're neutral and they'll listen to both sides of the case and they'll make a decision. But the other good thing about the law is that there are supports and services that are available um, to, to students and that having special education supports and services in place if your child needs them is a really important thing and it's a good thing. So we don't want you to think that having your child receive special education is detrimental. It's not. If your child needs it, if they have learning issues, if they have behavioral issues or social emotional issues, the law has now made those things accessible to your child. Right. No, special education is great when it's warranted. It's, it's fantastic. But the thing is, it's just not the first stop. And you can't be forced into it if you don't want it. But uh, there's a lot of reasons to want it. So here we go. If, if you think you want it and it, for your child, you go through the evaluation process. And the evaluation process, if you want to search the law on your own and read it, it's um, right there, 20 U.S.C. 14. 14, but I just picked out a few key uh, bits of that law that I think are really important. And that is, first, to get the ball rolling, so to speak, you're going to make your request for an initial evaluation. So as a parent, you can make that request. Or the LEA, which is um, the school, your local educational agency, may initiate a request for an initial evaluation to determine if the child is a child with a disability. So, so here's how it usually plays out. You see your child not doing well or you have a feeling that your child needs some extra help. So you tell the school, hey, I want my child evaluated. Um, for, I want an initial evaluation to see if they can receive specialized services. And most likely the school would agree to that. Um, it covers them. So I'm going to get into that. The school has an obligation. It's called a child find responsibility. And they have an obligation to find children that have disabilities to make sure that they receive special education. And something that I always point out with this is that it's called child find, right? So the word find is indicative that you're supposed to go out there, you know, with a magnifying glass and look around and, and find any children that may have a disability. It's not like child, here they are child um, right in front of you basically it's it's not saying that you don't have to look it's you have to actually it gives the school an affirmative obligation to find the children so even if the child isn't so obviously doesn't obviously present as a child with a disability well that district has an obligation to do the evaluations to find out if they're a child with a disability so that would be the other avenue the school seeing that the particular student is not performing as well as maybe they could if they had uh, interventions in place and we're receiving special supports and services so the school will approach the parent and say hey we have some concerns about your child we want to do an evaluation and see if uh, we can see what's going on so that we can give this child the appropriate supports and services so to do this for an initial evaluation parental consent is required so parental consent for evaluation shall not be construed as consent for placement or for the receipt of special education and related services so just because, and this is important to note, like some parents are afraid to uh, consent to evaluation because they're afraid of what might be found. And for that reason, and they're afraid that what might be found may lead to some sort of placement that they don't want for their child. Well, again, just because you consent to an evaluation doesn't mean that you're consenting for whatever will happen at the end of that evaluation. You always have the right to turn down all special education services just can't pick and choose some to turn down, so that's important to note. While you can decline all services, you can't say, well, I want this and this, but I don't want that and that. So once you accept some, then you have to come to a compromise with the districts on all the others. But just because your child's evaluated doesn't mean that um, they, they necessarily, uh, that you're consenting to any kind of placement or special education services. Just, again, it's just to get the ball rolling. And I think these slides go into independent evaluations. But also, just because the school district does an evaluation doesn't mean that their evaluator, you know, I mean, we have to just think about it. It's someone that most likely works for the school district. So um, there's a chance that maybe, you know, just maybe, this person's going to uh, give an evaluation that is in favor of what the school district wants it to say. And while though, you know, although I really do have to say that in most cases, um, these people are professionals, and uh, I don't think that 
there are many evaluators out there that would give false evaluations to help out their school districts. Um, I don't think it's also I don't think it's impossible that that maybe does happen. Um, generally, I don't think it's a problem though. But if you think that the evaluation that the district's evaluator um, did, the report that accompanied it, was not appropriate, you have the right to request your own independent evaluation. And your independent evaluation is going to be done by an evaluator that you choose, and the district is going to pay for that if they consent to it. And the reason why that is important, that the district will pay for it, is because when the district funds an evaluation, they're required to consider it a little bit more than they would be required to consider it if you went out and procured your own evaluation. So even though your insurance may be great and it may cover an evaluation, uh, it's always better to get the district to fund the evaluation. It's kind of like, um, what's that expression you say? You bought it. Yeah, if you bought it, it's yours. If you bought it, it's yours. So when the district pays for it, when they buy it, it's theirs. So they can't uh, very well. You know, the word consider is interesting. The districts are required to consider evaluations, but it doesn't really say, and that's the word, consider, um, how much they have to consider it. So, okay, I considered it, and I'm not going to use it. But when the district pays for it uh, through the independent uh, educational evaluation, um, you know, whatever level they have to consider it, it's, it's more than had you just brought the evaluation to them from your private evaluator without giving them the chance to evaluate first. I wanted to say something about the initial evaluation. Um, at one time, if a district, because as Joe said, the parent or the LEA, the LEA is the district, um, could request an evaluation. And if a parent indicated that they did not want their child evaluated, then the district had the right to go to due process and ask a hearing officer in PA, or if you're talking about New Jersey, um, it would be a judge. Uh, but that no longer exists, so that a school district can no longer take a parent to due process for an initial evaluation. However, and I'm not sure that Joe's going to talk about this today, but as a student with disabilities, there are different uh, rights for that child regarding disciplinary issues. So what can't happen is that if you request, if you, the district asks that you ex consider and accept an evaluation and you say no, and then your child has some disciplinary issues, you actually then can't come back and say, well, my child is a thought-to-be child with a disability. Once you indicate that you're, you do not want that evaluation, then they're not eligible for those same rights. If, on the other hand, if the district knew or should have known that your child has a disability, or if you go to the school district and ask your child to be evaluated, or you put it in writing that you want your child evaluated, then um, the district calls your child a thought-to-be. So it's a child who has a thought-to-be um, disability, and they would have those same rights under the disciplinary code as a thought-to-be um, eligible child. Right, and I think you mentioned behavior, and that's one of the key reasons why you would want that. If your child has uh, issues with behavior and um, you know suspension is on the table when uh, you're thought-to-be, or if you're a child with, uh, that receives special education, you get certain protections, and if there's a suspension that's going to last, you know, more than a certain amount of days, 10 days, they have to do what's called a manifestation determination, whereas with a, a general ed student, they wouldn't have to do this. A manifestation determination is where a determination has to be made whether the behaviors were a manifestation of the child's disability, so it limits the discipline that a district can impart on a child by having that thought to be or special education label. But that manifestation determination doesn't come, that meeting, until after the 10th day of suspension. Okay. Now, also you mentioned uh, due process um, and that the districts used to be able to take parents to due process for that reason. Now, the, mainly the only reason that you would see a district take a parent to due process is if a parent requests the independent educational evaluation that I was just speaking of and the district doesn't want to do it. So if the district says, no, I don't want it, I'm not going to do it, and they just put their foot down and say, we like our evaluation, we're not going to pay for you to get your own evaluation. Um, and I would say it's, it's not really for the, because of the money. Um, I would say it's, be, and I would say based on experience, and you know, a district wouldn't agree with me on this, but I would say it's not because of the money they're going to pay an evaluator because something like a speech evaluation is going to be under $2,000, and they may pay their lawyers uh, far more than that to fight it at a hearing. I would say it's not 
for the price of the evaluation, it's for the results of the evaluation. So if they're afraid of what another evaluation might show, or if they just, you know, they would say, well, we just have so much faith in our own evaluation that we're going to defend it in court. But, I mean, if you think is what it is, I always say, you know, for the sake of having a happy parent, why not just, if you're so sure of, of what's going on in your evaluation, why not let them have their own private evaluator, and if it's someone credible, then it's most likely going to be a fair and accurate portrayal of the child, and then maybe it's just that second uh, thing the parent needs to hear, a second opinion the parent needs to hear. They say, okay, well, you know what? I got my evaluator. They said the same or a similar thing to what your evaluator said. Uh, if it's some, you know, uh, doctor who you're not quite sure of their credentials and this and that, and they seem a little suspect or shady, well, then the district can fight that person in court and fight on their credentials and say, okay, well, this person would say anything you ask them to say. But if it's a, if it's a credible person and it's something that says if it's something similar to uh, what the district's evaluation found, then the district really has no reason not to want to do that independent evaluation. But again, if they don't want to do an independent evaluation, they have to. They have an affirmative duty to file for due process um, against the parent saying that they don't want to uh, do this evaluation and here's why we think our evaluation was good enough. What makes this a little interesting, at least in Pennsylvania, is that it shifts the burden of proof. So the burden of proof is uh, what, what you have to prove to win a case, right? So in special education law, it's preponderance of the evidence, which means pretty much like just 51% or so um, and of, you know, just leans to your side. It's not like beyond a reasonable doubt in criminal um, type court. This is, you know, more civil standards, civil law standards. So a preponderance of the evidence. Well, the burden is on the filing party in PA. In Jersey, the burden's still on the district. Um, in PA, the burden is generally on the parent. So that means it's the parent's um, obligation to show preponderant proof that the district messed up. When the district files for um, not wanting to complete an independent evaluation, now the burden's on them. So even though it just slightly shifts um, the burden, it shifts it. So now it's the district's uh, obligation to show a preponderance of the evidence that their evaluation was good. So what they say is if the evidence is in equipoise, um, you win, the parent wins. So if it's 50-50, if it could go either way, if it's a coin toss, the parent would win. If the district files, if it's a coin toss and you filed for something as the parent, then uh, the district would win. So it changes just a little bit gives you a little advantage, so it's always good to get a little advantage. Um, child find. This is what I just spoke about before, but here it is written out. Um, the district has the uh, duty, and this is what it, you know, in the law, to identify, locate, and evaluate. And how far they have to look. It's a thorough. So like I told you before, they have to look. The child doesn't have to necessarily show up with his arms waving, saying, hey, look at me, I need special ed education. Here it goes. Before providing special ed services, a thorough um, evaluation must be completed, and they must look uh, do it. They must do like a thorough job looking. So, so that's that. Um, timeline issues. Evaluations must be completed within 60 days from the time in which the parent uh, parental consent is received, or within the requirements set by the state, whichever is less time. So like I said before, um, no matter where you are in the country listening to this, the stuff's more or less the same because it's federal law. The only thing that would make it different is if you have more protection. So a state can't say, okay, well, the federal government gives um, a parent all these rights. We're going to limit the rights a little bit because we don't think the parents should get this many rights. It's actually the opposite. The only time a, a state can change things is that they want to give the parent more rights, which is kind of cool. So um, whatever a state gives, if it's more than the federal law, now that's what the school district is responsible for. And to take that even a step further, if the school district and their policies, if, if their own policies give the parent more rights, then they should really stick to those policies. So now that becomes the controlling law. Um, that may be a little more arguable, but what's not arguable is that once something's in an IEP, so the federal law gives a certain amount of rights, the state law may create more rights, and once you get that in the IEP, now all of a sudden that's your constitution. That's what you live by. So if you can get something in the IEP, you win. Like you have, they have to follow that. It's a contract. It's contract law um, that's enforceable federally. It's really good. If you can get something like 
I don't know, say that a child needs assistive technology and they need an iPad and an IEP. Now it's the district's responsibility to buy that child an iPad and make sure that they have it for learning so that they can get that extra assistive technology. Um, so the timeline issue that, like I said, the evaluations must be completed within 60 days um, from the time in which parental consent is received. So you get a form in PA called a PTRE, and that's a, a permission to reevaluate or a permission to evaluate form. And from the time that that's signed, the school has 60 days. In PA, the summer does not count towards the 60 days. So if you don't get this thing started until May or June or so, you're probably not going to get anything until um, you know October-ish at the earliest. Um, Penn, uh, Jersey, the timeline ticks during the summer, so that's good. So they work year-round, and if you start it in May, it should be uh, well done by September. Um, but in New Jersey, it doesn't include holidays. So, you know, you just have to be in tune with whatever your state um, determines as, as the timeline. And some things that will um, take away from the timeline, obviously and fairly, um, if you're being uncooperative as a parent, they, they, they can't hold that against the district. And, um, and again, summer and PA. So the extent of the evaluation, the extent of the evaluation, um, basically there's, there's no one single evaluation that can be determinative. It has to be uh, taken from a variety of assessments. And you can read it here, tools and strategies to gather relevant, functional, developmental, and academic information, including information provided by the parent. So this is important for two reasons. First, it can't be just one set evaluation. Like I said, you have to take into account all different areas and possible evaluations. And second, it's important that you um, have information from the parent. Recently, I had a case where you know all in the um, IEP it mentioned that the kid, the child, had certain needs at home, and that I think it was a speech issue there. He had you know he was able to speak relatively freely at home and at school he just shut down and, and didn't speak. Well, the problem was that in the evaluation they never interviewed the parents or asked them, well, what's different at home? What's going on at home while this child can speak? So they left out a really key part of it and in that case we're asking for an independent evaluation and I'm sure we're going to get it because you know the district was just really like remiss in their evaluation and they didn't follow through with the parent and see you know, what's going on and really investigate why it's working at home at, although it's not working at school. Especially social and emotional issues. You know, if you're taking your child to counseling, um, you really need to be upfront with the district so that they can address things that um, normally they wouldn't know unless you told them. So again, remembering that everything is confidential, and that when you speak to the district, you can let them know, you know, what you want in the report. But as long as they know what's going on, so that they can address those issues, because they may find that. Your child is in need of a psychiatric evaluation in addition to a psychological evaluation. So anything that you have to say um, is important. Okay. Um, and again, it's, it's going to meet the unique needs of your child, and that word unique is always key. Um, yeah, this shows about evaluations. I think this is cute and funny and, and really accurate. Um, everyone doesn't test the same, right? So one of these animals is going to have an easier time climbing the tree, uh, probably you know the bird and the monkey here. Um, the fish isn't going to get to the top of the tree, but that doesn't mean the fish doesn't have their own abilities and talents, so they should be tested differently. So testing should take into account the unique needs of your child. Here we go. This compares PA and Jersey, and again, I don't know the makeup of um, the attendees today who's listening, but um, I'm in PA. I also practice in Jersey, so I'm going to split those two up, but depending on um, your state, it's probably pretty similar. This just sort of shows some of the subtle differences between the two states. So um, PA, Jersey, both students with disabilities are entitled to attend school until the age of 21. Um, now here's where it's different in PA and Jersey, and, and some states will take the PA uh, version, some states will take the Jersey option. Jersey's a little more um, uh, beneficial to parents the way it's written out but in PA if you turn 21 prior to the start of the first day of the school year so say school starts September 1st just for numbers if you turn um, yeah the last day of August then you will not get services for that year okay say it starts September 2nd if you turn 21 September 1st you're not going to get services so that's simple to understand in Jersey 
If you turn 21 after June 30th, which is the end of their fiscal year, you're entitled to the next year. So really, you're well into your uh, 22nd year of life, and you're still going to receive services. So if you happen to be born in that sweet spot between um, June 30th and the first day of school, in Jersey, you basically get an extra year of education, whereas in PA, you would not get that extra time. So you want to check the subtleties in your state, because there's been times where schools have made mistakes, especially in Jersey, where they say, okay, you're done with your services, and it's just a slight oversight on the date of birth. So. Um, if you do have a child, you expect to receive uh, services in school for as long as possible. Just make sure that you know exactly um, the, the state's policy and where your child's date of birth fits in. Mm -hmm. um, here you go. These are more or less the same in all states, but the same in PA and Jersey. A school district cannot evaluate a student without the parent's consent. Um, again, there's probably no reason not to consent to it. Because if you don't like it, you can always request your own independent evaluation. Your consent for an evaluation may be revoked at any time. Make sure if you do revoke it, that you revoke it in writing. It's really important to do everything you can do in writing because a lot of these things, um, you know, first of all, you don't want to rely on your memory and the district's memory because without fail, they're going to differ. But uh, second, a lot of things come down to the date that things are done in writing. So you want to make sure that. Um, any communications, especially if things start becoming contentious with the school district, you want to make sure that you do it through email, and you want to make sure that any requests you make are done in writing. Um, a district may request a due process hearing to have a student evaluated, right? So they can request if, you, if the parent refuses the initial evaluation, the, the district can request a due process hearing. However, if they're found eligible for services, only the parent can approve the program and the placement. And the law does not require a district to seek due process if a parent um, refuses to agree to an evaluation. So the district doesn't have to seek due process if they, if they um, fail to submit to an evaluation. But um, the reason that the district would want to is to prove, without a doubt, that they're following their child fund obligations. Um, PA. Um, and this is what we spoke about earlier. You want to see what's going on in the general ed environment before you uh, go to special ed. And um, in Pennsylvania and, and in Jersey, when you make your request for an evaluation, you want to make sure that you have it really well spelled out, the reasons for the request and the nature of the child's difficulties and disabilities, because you want to make sure that the evaluation, um, if you're saying, you know, my child has trouble reading and this is what's really going on, and they have trouble in math, but really because it's, it's word problems in math and they're not able to read the word problem. So how could they ever get the math problem right? Well, if the district just gives a math um, evaluation, then it's not really, it's, it was there for no reason. You want to make sure that the evaluation is, is done for the right reasons. And if you really articulate the reasons that you have in the evaluation, um, it'll help you and help make sure that their evaluation was appropriate. Oh jump back, but here we go. If a verbal request is made, let me actually let's see what I skipped there. We have that. We talked about that. Um, this is one little difference. Uh, in Jersey, it's called the child study team, and a referral is made to this child study team, which is basically like an IEP team. There's a school psychologist, a social worker, and a learning disabilities teacher consultant, and they'll um, get together and make a decision if um, this child should receive special education. In PA, if a verbal request is made for a student evaluation, the school must provide the PTE, so that's the evaluation form, um, within 10 days. So they have 10 days to get that form to you. And within 10 calendar days, excluding summer break, when the written request or evaluation request form is received, the parent sent a consent form. So you're going to get the permission to evaluate, and you're also going to get a consent form. So I've had cases where parents thought they signed their consent form. You know, it's form after form. So you just got to make sure that you stay on top of it and don't think, oh, I already signed this form. This form looks really similar. Well, they're actually two slightly different forms, and you just have to make sure that you sign them both because the district can use it as an excuse of why they did not evaluate. And from the time that that form is received, the evaluations and the evaluation report, so that's the final report, must be completed within 60 days 
Um, and again, in PA, that doesn't include summer break. Uh, the parents should get a copy of that uh, evaluation report, and then an IEP must be developed within 30 calendar days after the evaluation report is completed, and then the IEP from that should be implemented within 10 school days. So if you max it out, you know, if you have your 60 calendar days, um, the 10 days before that, the 30 days after the 60 calendar days, and the 10 days, I mean, you're looking at um, over 100 days um, by the time the district has to really get the IEP going. So it's always better to start this process as soon as possible, especially if you consider there may be a break if you're in PA um, over the summer. So you want to make sure that you get these processes started as soon as possible because the district is given time. So these things, they happen quick. There's timelines, but sometimes it's not quick enough. So although there's timelines set out, um, the fact that the district doesn't quite get it done within those timelines isn't like a slam dunk case against the school district that they failed to provide your child with FAPE. So there may be procedural violations, but in reality and the way the, um, the law plays out, just because there's a procedural violation doesn't necessarily mean that uh, the school is in a real violation unless you can show some damages, unless you can show because the district took two extra days to complete these evaluations or even two extra weeks unless your child really had some real harm or damage done, it doesn't really matter. So these are serious timelines. Um, they're meant to be you know, hard and fast rules, but in reality, uh, there is some wiggle room for the district. Um, more or less the same as PA in Jersey. So uh, once there's an IEP completed, you approve that IEP by signing the NORA, and that's, I spoke about that a little bit, the notice of the recommended placement. And if it's the initial evaluation, you have to sign that NORA in order for the program to be implemented. So if you just fail to sign it, the program can't be implemented. You actually have to sign off on it. However, if it was a reevaluation, you can't just ignore it. You have 10 days to sign um, approving or disapproving the NORA. And if you don't sign it, by default, it's going to be initiated because of your um, lack of signing it. So that's the same, um, more or less, as in New Jersey, but in uh, New Jersey of 15 days, or the IEP will be implemented on a re eval not for the initial eval. Okay, if they deny, they being the school district, denies your request for an evaluation or re-evaluation, um, they also must provide a NORAP explaining why they decided not to evaluate your child. Then you can disagree with that NORAP and then request due process. And in Jersey, the parent must be given written notice of the decision not to evaluate or reevaluate within 15 days of that meeting with the child study team to determine it was um, convened to determine if testing was warranted and appropriate. A um, little difference here, and I don't know if I get into this later, but in PA, a due process hearing is, again, it's held in front of a hearing officer, so it's an officer, not office, but um, and they usually come out to the school building that your child attends, and they're all over the country. They're all, they're all really good and all really fair, and they're all over the country. So you may have one from Pittsburgh that can come out to Philadelphia, but um, that's the way it works. There's six over the country, uh, whereas in New Jersey, they, and these hearing officers don't have to be lawyers. Many of them are, but they just have to be neutral and have a very strong familiarity with special education law. Whereas in Pennsylvania, or whereas in um, New Jersey, it's actually in front of a judge, an administrative law judge. It's a more formal courthouse looking setting. And um, however, both have the same amount of power. Hearing officers in Pennsylvania have a tremendous amount of power and their orders uh, generally stick. Same as in New Jersey. For a reevaluation in PA, evaluations are mandated every three years, except for students with intellectual disabilities. Um, it's every two years. So just because an evaluation is required every three years does not mean that you can only do them every three years. Uh, a lot of districts will wait until the last day of the third year to get that um, reevaluation in. It should be completed. Again, there's argument on this, but I say it should be completed by the end of that three years. It's not enough that you know, the three years is up January 1st, and now you're going to start the reevaluation process, because remember, that can take 90 days or so. They should start, you know, with six months left in the, in the three years. 
But um, again, they can be done more frequently. They're usually not done, but they can be done more frequently. And also, they don't have to be done. If the parent wants to waive the right to reevaluate, they can. Again, except if the student has intellectual disabilities, you cannot waive that, and that has to be done every two years. Uh, with special education, as the parent, you can remove your child from special education at any time. You just put the request in the writing. If you don't want your child to receive special ed, you don't have to. Um, however, I think I said this earlier, it's all or nothing. So you can't say, because my child has a one-to-one -one aid, I, I want that one-to-one -one aid gone, but I want to keep all the other special ed services. In that case, um, you'd have to waive all the services not just the one-to-one -one service. So you can't pick and choose. It's not like a la carte. You have to take the, the whole package or nothing. Um, this decision cannot be challenged by the school. It's your right not to have special ed. And within 10 calendar days of receiving the request to remove services, the school issues a NORAP, which memorializes the fact that services are being stopped. The school is not obligated to amend the student's records or remove any reference to special education. So if the reason that you want to remove special ed services is because you're afraid that um, something will be on your child's record and maybe it'll hurt them in the future, which I don't think is ever the case. I mean, I really haven't seen that where someone's going to say, oh, this child received some special ed services so they can't get a job or whatever else parents might fear. Um, special ed services, I think, are, are designed and you know they're in place to let a student succeed to the best of their ability. So I think, if anything, it shows initiative and it shows that you're really trying to push your way forward, you're not declining any services or any advantages. Um, I haven't personally seen it hurt children, but if you know some parents are, are fearful of different labels and, um, and certain special education services on the record, but the fact is once it's on there, you can't get it off. So if they've kept receiving, if they've been receiving services and you thought that maybe by um, taking away the services at the 23rd hour, what have you, and it won't be on their record anymore, that's not the case. Okay, so now we've decided through the evaluation that the child who once was not receiving um, special ed services and did not have an IEP, now they're eligible for the special education services, and IEP is now going to be developed by the IEP team. And it has to have all the mandated components, and I can show you uh, links. I'll definitely send you guys to links of what um, IEP should look like, and I have IEPs that are annotated and they show all the different um, sections and what should be in that section, so you can compare it with your IEP and make sure all the components are there. In addition to that, it has to provide for meaningful participation of the parents, so you're not just at the meeting to watch them work, you're there to give your input, and you have to make sure that uh, the school's listening to your input. <laughs> this is a silly video uh, I have made that shows an example of a bad IEP meeting, but I'll just play it for a minute and I'll stop it. Uh, Hello, Mrs. Jones. You just sit there and listen to everything that we say. And please keep your mouth shut. Oh, no, they did not just tell me to keep my mouth shut. I feel as though these teachers and administrators are just not listening to a word that I say. I have tried to work with the school, but now I know you got it. So, um, so that's it, and that's an exaggeration. But in some cases, it's not really an exaggeration. I've even been to IEP meetings personally where that's kind of been um, the climate where it's kind of like, you know, we'll tell you what's going on, and no means no, um, without any explanation. So that doesn't fly. There's uh, avenues that you can take if the school district's treating you like that. It's not okay. I've talked to you already about the independent evaluation process, so I can cruise through this, but if a parent is not satisfied with the outcome of the school's evaluation, now you can request your own evaluation. So um, there you go. Um, you can always request a second evaluation. They can deny it, but you can file for due process. Actually, again, they have to file for due process if they deny it. So. Don't be afraid to ask for your own evaluation, and don't feel like you have to agree to their evaluation because you don't. Special considerations. Uh, one of the most important or you know prevalent special considerations right now, kind of a hot topic, is assistive technology. 
And every IEP, there's a section that you know, asks if the school considered the assistive technology needs of the child, and, and they should, especially if your child has you know, speech deficits or what. Um, so some reasons and needs for the assistive technology could be, uh, you can read these bolded points here, to meaningfully participate in the general ed curriculum. So if there's some piece of assistive technology and I mean, there's new stuff being implemented and designed every day. So um, it's hard to keep up with it. You really need a, a pro who specializes in AAC evaluations, alternative and augmentative communication evaluations, and they can tell you exactly what would fit your child. So there may be things that you haven't even thought of that are just coming out now that could help your child. So if there's any sort of communication needs, uh, you should have your child evaluated by one of these speech pathologists with an AAC credential and they may be able to find some piece of technology that's the perfect fit for your child. If it can help them again meaningfully participate in the general education curriculum, participate in school and extracurricular activities, access necessary educational print materials and uh, the list goes on and on even to include uh, participation in state and local assessments. So, um, even with you know state assessments, don't think that your child can't have the accommodations just because it's a state assessment and he's being compared to his peers or she's being compared to her peers. They're still entitled to uh, that technology if they qualify. And um, at the bottom there, the purpose of the assistive technology is to improve the functional capabilities of a child with a disability. And this decision is going to be made by the IEP team to determine if the use of the school purchased uh, assistive tech devices can be used in home. So uh, if they get a, a laptop throughout the day in school or an iPad throughout the day at school, the determination should be also made if that piece of technology can be used at home. So your child can bring it home with them and use it to uh, help with their homework and other things that they may need it for around the house. And once it's in the IEP, I said this earlier, it's the school district's responsibility to provide the piece of technology. So if you can get it in the IEP that the child needs a laptop, say, for writing because there's um, occupational therapy type needs are so severe they can't write on their own, then you're going to be able to get that uh, laptop at home because they most likely will need it for homework and then the district's going to have to buy it. Here we go. I, I spoke about this, the right, uh, right to revoke services. If you are moving um, from state to state or out of state, um, no requirement um, that a new initial evaluation must be completed, but a smart school district would do a new initial evaluation because they probably want to get their own people to look at it and, and see who this kid is. I mean, if you have a, a new child coming to the school and you know they have a special education needs, I mean, you want to evaluate them and, and see what's going on and see how you can best uh, provide for them. But there's no requirement that this must be done. They, the new district has to look at the old IEP and make sure that the new IEP is comparable. And if the IEP team determines that additional data is required, then uh, it would now be considered an initial evaluation and those new rules would apply. So even though your child's been evaluated in another school district and technically this is a reevaluation, for our legal purposes it would be considered an initial evaluation. Things to remember, um, assessments must address all areas of the uh, suspected disability. So these are just some takeaway points for you. Um, you want to make sure that uh, the assessment is thorough, basically. IEPs can be invalidated if they're not derived from appropriate evaluation. So if you have an IEP that's, uh, that comes from an evaluation that's later determined to be inappropriate, um, that IEP can be found to be you know, legally not to be providing FAPE. The IEP must be developed within 30 calendar days after the evaluation or reevaluation report. And you want to make sure that before you go to the IEP meeting, you better have a copy of that reevaluation report. And some school districts um, don't do it, but legally you have to have a copy 10 days before the IEP meeting. So you, before your IEP meeting, if the district hasn't provided you with a reevaluation report, ask for a new IEP date and say, hey, uh, yeah, we're happy to come to the IEP and put this in writing because it shows the district messed up. Say we have an IEP meeting scheduled for tomorrow, but we still haven't received the reevaluation report. Please send us the report and reschedule the meeting. You know, the ten days after the, that we received the report. So you shouldn't go in there empty-handed. Yeah, the other thing is too about the IEP meeting that the school district can't just uh, send you a notice and say, okay, we're going to you know have this meeting on March first, and you know giving you a week's notice. You have to have 
um, the ability to ensure that, it, that it's a, a, note, a mutually agreed upon time. So if, you know, they say we're having the meeting and then you tell them we can't make it, they can't say, well, we're going to have it anyway. But if you continually not show up for a meeting, obviously they're going to have it. But always get back to them in writing. Um, we like to tell our clients to make sure they put everything in an email, just something that's traceable so you can say, no, I did send it to you, and work with them. And out of this whole thing, I'm sitting here thinking that, as Joe said in the beginning, you need to work with the district and the district needs to work with you. Because, you know, if you have um, a relationship where you're both supportive of each other, then it, things just work out better. And it's not a matter of, you know, going in and placing blame. Um, District shouldn't place blame on you. You shouldn't place blame on the district. You just need to work together, and that's how you know, Joe operates as an attorney. He really tries um, to work things out and use his due process as the last resort. Because realistically, you know, you have to, you at the school, if your child's in first or second grade and they're going to be in this district till they're maybe 21, like you want to work together. So that's the first thing, but it's also um, sometimes unavoidable that you're going to have differences of opinions, and in that case, you know, you do have due process rights, and you do have the right to an attorney, and uh, something that's worth mentioning is that in these type of cases, there's something called fee shifting, where um, if you go to due process and you prevail, the district's then responsible to pay your attorney's fees. So the way the federal law is written, you're not expected to be able to afford an attorney to fight for what you're supposed to have gotten anyway. So if you're spending this money for an attorney to get something that's worth half the value of that, you're not expected to pay that. So if you have a case, most attorneys will um, take it for free because of the district or, or a small retainer just to show that you know, you're invested in the case and to get the initial expenses covered. Um, and then you know, that can be uh, reimbursable if if you prevail. But again, uh, with attorneys, I want to mention at the IEP meeting, if you bring an attorney with you to the IEP meeting, the district is responsible, uh, the district is required to bring their own attorney. They can't bring an attorney if you don't have an attorney. But once you bring a lawyer, they're going to bring a lawyer. However, you can bring an advocate with you. So there's um, free advocacy services and there's paid advocacy services, but you can search around and find an advocacy service where you can bring someone with you that will help you fight someone that's um, knowledgeable and familiar with the law, and you can bring these people, and the school district can't deny their attendance. And some school districts may try to, but just put it in writing, like, hey, we have an IP meeting schedule for today. I brought my advocate. You told me to go home. Please explain why this happened, um, because that's something that the district absolutely should not um, decline you the opportunity to have an advocate. I don't know that any parent, you know, you're going to learn this stuff because maybe you're maybe, maybe not, you have a child with a disability, and you're just learning um, the hard way, really, you know, through trial and error and through just going through the process. But, you know, even if you have a parent who has a child a few years older than your child who's a little bit more familiar with it than you, bring that person with you to the meeting. You're allowed to bring people. Um, even if it's just someone who makes you feel a little stronger and more confident and you'll speak up if that person's with you. Um, don't be afraid to bring that person to the meeting. You're entitled to it. Um, again, you can revoke services at any time. So let me show you a couple links. And then uh, you know, I'll take some questions. For Pennsylvania, if you go to this website, odr-pa.org, this is the Office for Dispute Resolution. And this has um, more or less everything that you need. You can learn so much from this website. They've done such a good job. You can go to due process, due process overview. This will give you an overview. I think somewhere down here there's videos. You can watch this video. It's a mock due process. So you can see, this is it's like hearing officer Valentini, who's a, one of the good ones. Hi, I'm Carol Overman, as you probably know. And, and, uh, so people will you can watch, um, you can see this is just, they put on basically a play, a mock due process hearing, just to let parents know what's going on. So I think that's so cool that there's these resources out there. I'm you know, surprised, really, at how good this website is. You can look at the hearing officer's decisions on this website. Um, you can search them. So say you're in, and I'm just going to go with Severs first, say you're in Abington Heights School District and your issue is assistive technology. And you can see that school district hasn't had any cases with that, but say you're in that school district and you want to see all the cases they've had, you can see them. So you can see on um, June of 2013 there was a decision about residential placement and then you click that and you can read the decision. You can see this person was the family's lawyer. This person 
I was the school's lawyer, and here's what happened. If you go down to the bottom, you can see that in this case, the district was found to, so the parents lost this one. The district's required to take no further action. So that's that, but you can look and you can find ones that found favorably. And there's you know, a lot of facts for why that may have happened. But you can um, go through the decisions and see um, what's going on. Um, if you go to on um, our website, ed-law.com, there's another link for resources and you can get copies of um, different presentations. There's some question and answer sections and um, other things here where you can get links. But uh, if there's one link that I want you to have, it's this odr-pa.org if you're in Pennsylvania. Um, and if, you know, if you're in another state, you can let me know and I can tell you which link to go to for that. But um, you know, that's more or less it. So I want to uh, open it up to questions right now. Yeah, go ahead. Can I just talk about really quickly the reevaluation process? Because the reevaluation process occurs every three years. So children who are eligible for special ed services must be reevaluated at least once every three years or sooner. Um, and you can be asked to waive the three-year reevaluation but we strongly suggest that you don't waive that because you really do want to update um, information about your child. If you live in Pennsylvania, children who have intellectual disabilities must be reevaluated at least once every two years. And you cannot waive that. So if you're asked to waive it, say no, because you're not permitted. The school district is not permitted to ask you to waive that. Right. So. So what, uh, what questions do you have and how can we help you moving forward? Hi, Joe. Do you hear me? Yeah. Okay, great. So we have, um, we have two questions so far. One I've sent to you through the chat panel. Do you Mike, see that? No. no, I did not. Try again. Okay, I will send it again. Hold on one moment. Wait, wait. The chat panel may have been minimized. Okay, hold on. Yeah, it was minimized. Um, oh. Can you discuss this process for children in education situations other than the public school system, private, voucher, homeschool, etc.? Right, so um, if you are in private schools, if you're in a charter school, they have to follow the same rules because the charter schools run under um, the, same, the same rules as public schools. However, if you're in a private school, it's kind of tough because you know, it's free market. You chose to pay money to go to that school. So if you're not happy with the way things are, your real remedy or recourse is to just take your kid out of that school, take your child out of that school, and put him into another school. Hands down, the public schools can offer way more than private schools can offer because they have just way more funding. And they have federal funding that requires them to do certain things that private schools, you know, a parochial school or private school doesn't have to do. So unfortunately, there's not much you can do, and I really don't get involved in cases um, with private schools unless it's a really severe incident. Because like really, the way it is is that you know it's a private school. If you chose to send your child there, if you're not happy, you just your recourse is to send them somewhere else. Um, charter schools they have to they have to follow the rules. But um, yeah, again, with private schools, it's unfortunate. However, uh, as far as child find goes. Um, the school district still has a child find obligation to children even in private schools. So um, the school district not only has to look at their own students, but they also have to look at other students and make sure that if these students are in need for special education services, they're evaluated. And sometimes through your local intermediate unit, you can get some kind of pull-out services from your speech or OT. But again, public schools will provide you uh, the most services. If they can't provide you the services, now it's their obligation to send you to a private school, which may be different than the private school your child is currently at. You know, it could be a, you know, it's what's called an approved private school, where they have just really high level of services for kids who have really severe need. But um, again, if it's a private school, um, your options are limited. So another question. My daughter has the 504 plan. She is in second grade and has loss of hearing. Is this one of the best services for her? Someone has suggested there are better services for her. Is that true? Answer. Yeah, I mean, a 504, it depends upon the services, and we, I don't know if the person is able to answer them. But obviously, a, an IEP will give the most services. It just depends on what that child needs. So 
a 504 would give um, extended time and small group instruction. But if you're, you know, if the child needs um, additional services that's not able to uh, be given via 504, then most certainly you should ask for um, the team to meet to be evaluated for services through an IEP. Okay. Do these rights continue to community college? Um, mm -hmm. Certain rights do, the 504 type rights for um, extended time on tests and things like that. Um, you can get, but however, you know. You don't get much more. You don't get much more. Um, again, this is really uh, 3 to 21 in the public school setting. Um, after school, after um, high school, uh, your rights are really limited and it's different. It's not covered under IDEA anymore. Any more questions? Yes, there is one. I'm typing it to you right now. Oh, there it is. Do you see it, Joe? Um, question four. What steps can a parent take if the district states in a progress report that all is being accomplished and some of the services haven't been administered? So I, I wonder if this question, if the parent's thinking that even though the progress report's saying that everything's good, you're not agreeing with the progress report. So you're, you're thinking that maybe it's inappropriate or inaccurate reporting. Um, and you think that maybe uh, like the district's maybe covering up their, their lack of progress through a progress report. Can you follow, can they follow up with that? Is that what's going on? Do you not agree with the progress reporting? Or if you think that the progress reporting is accurate, um, and if you think your child's making meaningful progress, even though some of the services haven't been administered, then you know it's considered that the IEP is a fluid document and it can be changed at any time. So maybe your child doesn't need all those services. But if the case, and then you can amend the IEP, but it should be amended, goal is definitely to wean down on the services. So um, we, you know, with the baseline data, we see how a child's performing with certain services, and then how they, as we take away the services, hopefully they can keep performing the same way. But if it's your um, theory that the progress reporting is not accurate, um, then you should ask for some type of evaluation to see where your child really stands and to see what's going on. And if it finds out that hey, the school is saying my child has all A's, but I know that my child can't read because they stare at their textbook for hours and they're trying to do homework, yet he's getting an A in reading or she's getting an A in reading, you should ask for an evaluation to see what's really going on. I use the word an IEP is fluid. And what parents have to understand is that you can open up an IEP meeting at any time. You can request a meeting from your school district at any time. So, you know, again, you need to look into what goes into a child's grade and how the teacher's grading. Oftentimes, have a child, or not oftentimes, but it, but it could happen that a child is failing every test. However, the teacher is grading homework. So if the student is getting an A every night for doing the homework that either they're doing or the parent is mostly doing for them, then that grade is going to be skewed. So you always want to look at the data, keep the data, because the data is driving the instructions. So keep copies of the test. Keep information regarding everything that your child's doing. And don't hesitate to call the school and ask for a meeting. Even if your child's in high school and your child has many teachers, you know, call the case manager, say, you know, I'm, I'm concerned about, and, and tell them the subject area, and ask for a meeting because they have to give you a meeting. That's, that's a definite. Cool. What else? OK, Deborah, um, I've unmuted you. so. If you're able to speak, would you like to elaborate? Okay, I, it, looks, it looks like she might be having, um, she's not able to access the, the audio. Okay. You can always um, to, uh, yeah, you can always email, if you, you can give anyone my email address and I'm happy to answer questions or chat on the phone. Okay. No matter okay, what sounds time. good. Happy to help. Okay. All right, thank you both. You know what I think we can do? Um, let's take like maybe a five-minute intermission, and I'll see if anyone else has any more questions. Um, then, and we'll just come back, and then if I do get questions, I'll send it to you via the chat bar again. Okay, sounds good. I'll check you in five minutes. Yeah, okay, so at 12.15, we'll come back. Okay, bye-bye. Okay, thank you. Bye-bye.
Okay, now we are back. It's 12.15. Um, it looks like I got one more question. That's for Joe to answer. Yeah, so um, I see the follow-up to the um, question. So as I suspected that um, you're not seeing the progress, but the school saying there's progress. So, um, you know, that, that could be a case for due process. That might be something where if you can show that your child's not making progress, um, you, you have to show you know, why you think so. You said that this is a result of a new IEP and so you just tested, but maybe um, this child was just tested uh, by the district and maybe you need your own evaluation to show how uh, this child's really doing. So um, you know, you're gonna have to, you have to prove the lack of progress, but if they're just not providing the services in the IEP, again, the IEP is a contract, they have to provide the services. I'm not exactly sure which services they're not providing, but you know they have to provide everything that's in the IEP, so um, so that's that. So if they're not providing everything that's in the IEP, uh, it doesn't really matter that they're saying that she's making all the progress in the world. If you're not seeing the progress and you have proof that they're not providing the services, you have a case there. So you may want to consult with an advocate or an attorney. And I don't know what state you're in, but you can um, give us a call if you feel like it, or just you know search around for someone that can help you um, in your state um, and let them know what's going on. But really, they have to. to properly answer this uh, detail of the question, someone has to look at your IEP and they have to look at her records and they have to see if um, certain things are matching up and they have to see if there's any uh, discrepancies. It's kind of like forensics. Like Once you really start looking at it, you can lie or, or fudge progress reporting on paper, but uh, everything else has to match up. So there's a lot of different things that have to match up and once someone looks at your IEPs and everything else, they can see if everything's matching up. Something that's really helpful that we always suggest to parents who have children in special ed is to keep a file. Keep a file of every reevaluation report and every IEP and any emails that you have. Um, keep all of that together so that if you do seek help of an advocate or an attorney, what um, is all, what we do is we look at the reevaluation reports from year to year and we see whether or not the child's strengths and needs have changed. And then we look at the IEPs and we see it, every area from behavior to academics for each subject for everything, attendance, and we see has the child made progress. And if we can show that the child hasn't made progress, and also if you have IEPs that have the same goals and objectives from year to year and showing the same level of achievement from year to year, then um, that means that your child hasn't been given faith free appropriate public education. So the first thing you may want to do is start gathering all your stuff together and make your file and um, you know keep everything in order and that just makes it easier for you to know whether or not your child has been getting what they need because let's face it, you're the advocate for your child. So someone in Florida asked how you um, can find these resources for your own state. You know it's always, it's really as simple as starting with a Google search but um, I found fldoe.org, so that's your Department of Education website. Just start checking that out. Some states are better than others, but um, I do know that Florida has you know, a lot of protections for parents and, um, and they take their public school system seriously. And although there's problems, um, there's the same sort of uh, due process options available. So start on their Department of Education website and check from there. Um, yeah, and we can help you with... Yeah, let me see what else. Uh, another question that was uh, all part of the question number four and then Florida and I think that's all the questions unless there's anything oh, else. I have one more it just came in. Okay good. All right having it to you right now. There it is. Okay so sorry if this was addressed who performs the independent evaluation and our son's IEP only addresses math learning disability but has deficit in other areas of learning as well that need to be included. So the independent evaluation, uh, you pick the person. So that's what makes it good. That's what makes it you know, really helpful. You get to pick someone that you trust. And if you're working with an advocate or an attorney, I'm sure they have a network of people that they trust. So um, once you get involved in this um, area, there's a few names that float around. And, and these people have great reputations. So you want to make sure that, so there's some, just for an example, there's some amazing child psychologists out there. and there's. Child psychologists really for every need, and some break off and specialize in, in certain areas, and some really great neuropsychologists, but they differ in, in what they specialize in. And there may be one that's 
just those concussions, and they're amazing at concussions and childhood sports injuries and this and that. Then there's other ones who can diagnose autism and and um, and alternatively uh, say if someone's not a child with autism. So you want to make sure that again, who picks the independent evaluator? You do. Um, but you want to make sure that it's not just your family doctor or someone that you're used to, but someone who actually specializes in this particular thing because um, ultimately what may happen is this evaluator, you're going to need someone who, who can, um, I don't know if to say stand up under pressure, but there's the pressure of court and due process hearings and a lot of times these people are going to be called to testify. So we've had some amazing psychiatrists, for example, who have uh, so much experience and these people are capable of this particular psychiatrists are capable of, of so much, but when the word court comes in, they freeze up and they want nothing to do with the case anymore because court's involved. Um, and psychologists are the same way. So these people are, you know, they like being in their offices and speech and language therapists and all sorts of people are, have this common thing where they want to work with children and they want to help children, but the second that court's involved and it may be confrontational, uh, they don't want that kind of confrontation. So you want to make sure that if it comes to it, that you have an expert who's willing and able to uh, participate in a court hearing. So, and the word expert is important because if the school district is um, has a PhD, a doctor uh, doing the psychiatric, or, I'm sorry, doing the psychological evaluation, then you also have to match the credentials of the independent person. You don't want to get a school psychologist who doesn't have their their doctorate. Um, to go against a psychologist who has their doctorate. So you want to look at things like that. Um, we had a family who found a wonderful child psychiatrist um, who was more than capable of going up against the school districts, but that person was not board certified yet. They were in the process of taking their boards. So again, that wouldn't have held up. So take a look at all of those things when you're selecting your independent evaluator. Yeah, you no, know, make sure you're a psychologist, make sure they've been in schools. Like it, it's really easy to discredit someone and say, okay, well, how many IEP teams have you been a part of? And like, what, what's an IEP? You know, so you want to make sure that you just have someone who does this stuff. Yeah, yeah. An and someone who can go in and knows how to do a classroom observation is really important as well. Any others? Great, yes, and I just received another question um, from the same asker. Great. So I will send that along. Um, okay. Can a complete neuropsychological evaluation, we just had one done, be considered an IEE? Who do I give that to? Okay, yeah, great. So you want to make sure, and that's good, that you got the neuropsych done. Um, we like them a lot, and we think it's, you know, sometimes schools don't want to fund them. I don't know how much you pay for it or if your insurance did it. It could be $5,000, you know, easily, especially if you want the neuropsychologist to uh, participate in the IEP meeting. So. Um, yes, it would be considered an independent evaluation. Um, however, the district did not fund it. So they have to consider it, but how much they have to consider it's a question. Um, you give it to you can give it to the school psychologist, you can give it to um, who you can give it to anyone on the IEP team. Just make sure the school gets it. Email it so there's proof that they got it. Ask for a, a meeting to be convened to consider the report and hopefully they consider it. If they don't consider it, and I don't know your exact situation, but uh, I'm interested in it. If, if you think that your child's not getting certain services and this independent neuropsychological that you bought um, is saying that your child needs something else and the district says, no, no, we're not going to give it to you, then you, you could have a, something, you know, you'd have to move forward with due process because um, your evaluations are you know, competing evaluations. So um, who do you give it to to get it started? You can give it to anyone on the IEP team. Um, email it to them. If you if you communicate directly with the school psychologist, email it to that person, and, um, and that's it. Hopefully, you can get a meeting convened with the district, and hopefully, you can get your neuropsychologist there to help advocate for you and say what you know, exactly what they think your child needs and why. Yeah. And um, did you ask for the uh, neuropsych, and they declined? Um, they declined paying for it or providing it for you, and then you went out on your own, or did you just go out on your own and get the neuropsychological because you thought you needed it? Hmm. Let's see if she'll answer. Um, she said that they went on their own after noticing changes. Okay. Yeah, that's fine. So um, 
you know, you can even you can ask for the uh, district to reimburse you for it. Uh, they may or may not, and you may or may not have had to pay for it out of pocket. But it doesn't seem like that's your concern. Your concern is really having it considered. Um, if it's considered, it's considered an independent evaluation. It's not considered an evaluation like as if they pay for an IE. Um, again, best case scenario, you show it to the school, they reconvene a meeting, and you guys come to an agreement. And I see no reason why that should not happen. So hopefully that's what happens, and that would be the best case scenario. Um, if it's not, and if the school fights your evaluation, then you would have to take some steps from there. But hopefully, you know, get it in the school's hands as soon as possible. Don't hold it from them. You know, I've had parents who've had these evaluations that say certain things, and then they're like, "But the school never did it." And then it turns out they never provided it to the um, to the school. So I, I notice here you're in Washington State. So um, yeah, I got to tell you, I don't know much about how Washington does it, but I know everyone's under the same federal rules. So. Just get it to your school and uh, hope that you guys can come to some kind of quick resolution. And if, if you can't, you know, Google search for a, an advocate or a lawyer out there and, um, you know, be the squeaky wheel. There's also for your state, it's just that if you go to your Department of Education website, they all have um, a support resource. So, for example, in Pennsylvania, it's PATAN, P-T-T-A-N. Um, in New Jersey, it's E-I-R-C. So if you go to your website or call the State Department of Ed and ask them, you know, what is the agency that's affiliated with them, yep. so they typically will answer all of your questions. Great. Yeah, and there, see, that's how easy it is. Um, it was just able to be pulled up right now, so then you can just explore that website and uh, see what that's off. It looks like a nice website just from you know, first glance, but uh, there you go. Yeah, Google okay. is definitely your friend, so. <laughs> Great. Okay, it looks like that's all the questions I have. Um, but as Joe, you mentioned, I can share your email with the guests, yes. and they can reach out personally if they have any more follow-up questions. Yep, absolutely. And I, you know, I wish everyone luck. And you know, that, again, I like to end it. The most important thing is, you know, I guess the most important thing is letting your child advocate for themselves um, whenever they can. So if they can be present in meetings or decide what they want, that's the most important. But second most is being a good advocate for your child, and you obviously all are for being here and, and listening to this and just, you know, soaking up whatever knowledge you can. So keep doing what you're doing because um, there's a lot of stuff out there. You know, there's a, the federal law really provides for a lot, and I think that uh, I know that if you're not asking for it or even demanding it, you most likely won't get it. So there's few school districts who are going to give you something without you asking for it. So don't be afraid to ask. Obviously, if you don't ask, you can't get it. And just keep doing what you're obviously doing and advocating for your children. And thanks for listening. Great. Yeah. Thank you, Joe. And thank you, Mom, for participating, too. Yeah. yeah. You're welcome. So I'll be sending the recording out um, this coming week. So keep an eye on that. And I will also include Joe's email on that, too. So thank you again, Joe and Mom. Thank you. And you're welcome. Well, I can just sign, quit this right here. It's fine. Yeah, you can quit it. I'm going to turn it off now. So have a great weekend. Uh, you too. Bye, everybody. Bye. -bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.